Today we're going to be looking at the assurance of forgiveness. And it's a, it's a big one. It can be one of the biggest hurdles to people actually putting their trust in Jesus. To go, man, you, you don't know what I've done. It cannot be forgiven. It's too great. Or it's gone on for too long. Or I'm too far from God. Can't be done. But even people who have been a Christian for a long time, decades, can struggle with, am I really forgiven? Like, sure, I believed it back when I wasn't so bad or back when I was younger and hadn't had time to really do anything significant, but man, I should have known better. Or I thought I would have overcome this sin by now. And here I am, decades into my Christian faith, still wrestling with sin. Surely, I, I, if I was really in Jesus, surely I would have overcome this thing by now. And so we've seen people struggling with this assurance right through the spectrum of, of you know, brand new Christians to people who have been in Christ for a very, very long time. And so it's so important that we understand the nature of our forgiveness and the extent of our forgiveness. So that's what we're going to do today. A key verse. We have, we have a key verse each week and I'm encouraging you to memorise these verses is 1 John 1. And this is what John writes. He says, if we confess our sins, so if, we can, if we acknowledge we're sinners, he, that is God, is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we confess our sins, he's faithful He is righteous to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's pray and we'll dig into this verse. And so, Father, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your faithfulness towards us. We just sang about it before. So thankful that you don't approach us each new day with a new outlook or according to how we feel or according to how we have acted the day before, but according to your faithfulness. And so help us, please, Father. Help us have open hearts and minds to your Holy Spirit speaking to us. Open ears to your scriptures that would go away today changed more into the likeness of your Son. More confident, not in our goodness, but in your faithfulness in your forgiveness, your forgiveness, and in our forgiveness, in our righteousness that comes from your son Jesus in whose name we ask. Amen. So before we even get into like what is forgiveness, why is there forgiveness? What does it what does it look like and what does it mean? How can we how can we live as those assured of our forgiveness? So important to realize again that his forgiveness is based on his faithfulness. So I put it to you, uh, possibly the entire reason that we struggle with forgiveness, to, to accept initially our forgive, uh, God's forgiveness, our forgiveness, and then to live in light of our forgiveness, is because we approach God according to our righteousness, like our, our inherent righteousness, my self-righteousness. And so when I consider my own works, when I consider my own thoughts, when I consider my own ways uh, across kind of the expanse of my life to now, and as I look forward, even the trajectory that I'm on, I go, well, I'm not good enough for God. I haven't done it in my own right. I haven't kind of climbed a moral ladder or, or stairs to kind of get over some sort of threshold of acceptance. I haven't done that. And so rightly, I might look at my life and and think, okay, I I don't deserve his forgiveness. Accurate. That's what I'm viewing it from my perspective. When I view it from the the perspective of his faithfulness, when I consider who he is, unchanging, faithful, and in accordance with his 
righteousness in that he is perfect and always acts in accordance with his perfection, with his righteousness. If that is the reason and where I'm anchoring the hope and the assurance of my forgiveness, then that's something that doesn't change. Even as I consider my weakness and brokenness and sinfulness and rebellion, that I remember I'm forgiven according to his faithfulness. Unwavering faithfulness. Why do we need forgiveness? Paul writes about this pretty, pretty extensively. Uh, when he writes to the church in Colossae, he says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. So he doesn't like cut corners or pull punches. He says, oh, we were evil. We did things that were evil. We, in our day, 2024 in Australia, uh, we kind of have this, um, we have this spectrum of, well, there's, there's good here and there's really good over there. And then there's just neutral, uh, and then there's bad, and then there's evil down here. Uh, when the scripture writers talk about evil, they're more talking about it in, a, in terms of our relationship with the holy God. And so when they say things like, man, the heart is evil and deceptive, desperately wicked, or the, the inclination of the heart is evil only all the time, to our modern minds, we might go, oh, but sometimes I have... I sometimes have good thoughts, so that can't be true because we're operating on this spectrum of you know, evil to really, really nice, whereas that's not how the scriptures are using this word evil. It's talking about our abandonment of God and his ways. And so when Paul writes this, he says, man, once you were alienated from God because you and I, we alienated ourselves from him because we were evil, because we acted against him, we rebelled against his right rule and reign in our lives. He writes to the Ephesians and he says, actually, it's more like this. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which, you, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now work in those who are disobedient. He goes on and says, you were by nature objects of his wrath, of God's wrath, by nature, because we were dead in our sins. We, we weren't just like, again, bad or evil or even neutral on some spectrum where we're trying to get better and better and better or if we kind of put it up this way, we're trying to climb this moral or karmic ladder to get over a threshold, saying it's not, it's not like that. We're actually, it's more like we're dead in our sins. Holy, as in WH, wholly unable to do things pleasing to God. We could not climb any rungs on that ladder. We weren't able to climb the ladder because we were dead. But, he says, verse 4, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in sin. It's by grace you've been saved. Then he writes to Timothy, his um, like son in the faith. <clears throat> and he writes, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. He's saying, you've got you to listen. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Why did Jesus come? He came to save sinners. Paul says, of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. So this is what Paul writes. He writes, do you know why I was saved? So first he says, do you know why Jesus came? Jesus came for sinners, like, like you and me. And he says, do you know why I was saved? Because I was the worst sinner. Paul was the one who was commissioned to go house to house hunting Christians. He didn't even need to be commissioned. He, he talks about himself as being zealous for this work. Like he puts up his hand. I volunteer to go hunt Christians. So is that, that was Paul's Mindset. When the first Christian who died for their faith was murdered, the people who murdered him took the guy's clothes and put them down at Paul's feet. He was the one there 
sanctioning it, running it. And Paul says, this is why I was saved. Because I was the worst. I was the furthest. The most self-righteous. The most heinous. So that nobody could think, well, I'm too far from God. I'm too far gone. I've done too much. It's been too long. I'm too far down on the karmic ladder. Paul says, I was on the lowest rung and I started to dig and he still saved me. Nobody is too far gone for the grace and the forgiveness of God. Paul basically says, if I can be forgiven, anyone can be forgiven. It's in scripture. It says, again, he said, this saying is trustworthy and should have your full acceptance. It says, I'm the worst and even I'm saved. The grace of God is more powerful than the most heinous sinner. What's the nature of God's forgiveness? The psalmist writes, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sin from us. The nature of God's forgiveness is total. Total forgiveness. You can go to the North Pole, and you can go to the South Pole, but you can't go to the East Pole. It just keeps going. God's forgiveness is complete. God's, condition, God's forgiveness is conditional on Jesus' sacrifice, not on how I'm feeling day to day. Not on how I'm wrestling with sin today. Not on the last time I prayed or read the scriptures. But conditional on Jesus' perfect sacrifice. This is the nature of his amazing grace towards us. Because he's God, he doesn't leave sin unresolved. Oh, sorry, because he's just. Because he's just, he doesn't leave sin unresolved. Because of God's perfect justice, he must do something about sin. And when we are the sinners, <clears throat> when we are uh, like um, Jesus says in uh, John 3.36, he says, you know, for those who believe in the Son, they have eternal life. For those who don't believe, or who reject the Son, God's wrath remains on them. Just wrath because of their sin. And so we might look at someone like, like Paul and say, well, that guy went house to house like locking up and murdering Christians. Of course we want God's justice on him. Of course we want that sin to be dealt with justly. Then when we look at our own sin, we might, try to, we might kind of mitigate our sin a little bit. We say, well, well I'm, I'm only stealing because of this, or I only lied because of that, or, you know, it's victimless crime, or it doesn't really matter, or I'm just being true to myself. Because God is just. He doesn't leave sin unresolved. Because God is holy, sinners cannot stand, cannot be in relationship with a holy God. So because he's just, every sin is punished. Because he's holy, sinners can't be in relationship with God. But because he loves us, God dealt with our sin so that sinners could be in relationship with him again. Because he's merciful, Jesus took the punishment for our sin instead of us. So he's just, so there must be justice. He's righteous and holy, so sinners can't be in relationship with him. But he loves us and wants relationship with us. Therefore, he bore the weight of his own justice. And now because of his justice, and we can trust in his justice, we can trust in his justice because scripture tells us so. We can also trust in his justice because uh, we see that he is so uh, adamant about justice that Jesus paid the penalty for our sin, which is death. So we can be confident in his justice. And because of our confidence in his justice, we know that because that sin has already been 
dealt with on the cross, God will not punish us a second time for the same sin. That sin is dealt with on the cross. So when we, we started back with God's faithfulness, that we can trust in him because he is faithful and doesn't change. He is just and, and deals with sin, loves us, and so he dealt with sin himself. And because he has dealt with sin, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So for us, our relationship to sin has radically changed. Where John 3, 36 says, man, for those who don't believe in the Son, God's wrath remains on them. But for those who do put their trust in Jesus, there is no wrath. The wrath has been absorbed, dealt with on the cross. That punishment has been paid. Justice has been served. And now there's no more justice other than the recompense or the, the rewards of holiness. So we have full confidence in God's love and his mercy, full confidence in his holiness and his justice that causes us to not worry about our, forgive, our forgiveness. Our forgiveness isn't contingent on how you're doing today. Our forgiveness is contingent on what Jesus has already accomplished and the faithfulness of God. So when you feel condemned, and you will, because we're still going to sin, but God's grace and our hope and our discipline is wrapped up in becoming more like Jesus and wrestling with sin and winning rather than wrestling with sin and losing. But when we do fail and when, we, when the deceiver whispers in our ear, that's too much for God to forgive. Or if you were really a Christian, you wouldn't be struggling with this anymore. Uh, we can say, actually, it's not based on how I'm doing today. It's based on what Jesus has already accomplished and God's faithfulness to me. Jesus has paid the penalty for that sin and now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So Paul goes on and says, so does that mean we just go on sinning so the grace may abound? And he says, hell no, no, we don't do that. Uh, our relationship to sin has changed. It's changed. Uh, the promise of the forgiveness of sin, man, we could track that it's God's plan from the very beginning. Um, you read it through the Old Testament, things like this in Jeremiah 31. It says, No longer shall each one teach his neighbour and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. King David knew about it. Psalm 32 says, How joyful is the one whose sin is forgiven. Our relationship to sin has changed. We're not beholden to it anymore. We're not anchored to it. We're not slaves to our sin anymore. But rather, we can walk in victory over sin. And even if we do stumble, we are joyful because God doesn't treat us according to our sins anymore, but according to Jesus' perfection. Because he has taken our sin and imputed to us his righteousness. He says, uh, how joyful is the one whose sin is covered? How joyful is the person whom Yahweh does not charge with iniquity, in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones became brittle from my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was drained as in the summer's heat. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. I didn't conceal my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is faithful pray to you immediately. Don't wait. God is faithful to forgive. He's keen to forgive. He's done everything necessary. It is done. It's dealt with. His justice met. Our sin paid for, our penalty taken. Taken. 
And like John says, if we confess, and like David says, if we confess, and then he goes and says, do it now. Don't wait. Bring it all into the light. This is the beauty of the forgiveness of God. Is that it means we don't have to live with a, like a barrier or layer of protection over us, trying to project an image of how we want to be seen to the world or to God, as if he couldn't see through it. We don't do that. We live lives laid bare. We're no longer trying to hide in the dark because, oh my goodness, what if, what if someone found out about this? That's the old way. That's, that's the slavery to sin. That's sin determining how we live. That's the old way. But rather because he is faithful and he is paid for it, we can bring everything into the light. It doesn't change how God thinks about you when you confess your sin. He already knows it. He's already dealt with it on the cross. If you're in Christ, you already have the assurance of forgiveness. There's no groveling. There's no obsequiousness or kind of, there's no kind of uh, worrying or is this, is this going to be too much? Is this going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back? But rather we go with full confidence because of his faithfulness to us. He is faithful and righteous and will forgive as far as the east is from the west. Prophet Micah, he says this, uh, Micah 7 Verse 18, who is a God like you? Forgiving iniquity and passing over rebellion for the rem, uh, remnant of his inheritance. He does not hold on to his anger forever because he delights in faithful love. He says no one's like God. There are no gods like God, like Yahweh. We are not like him. We hold on to things. Says God has forgiven your Sin and your rebellion, where we walked away from him, we now walk with him. Not because we have turned our lives around, because he has brought us from death to life. There's no sin beyond God's forgiveness. It means there's nothing that you've done which isn't covered by his mercy. It means there's no guilt or shame that's stuck to you. How others once thought of you, or how you maybe even still think of yourself. God hasn't just forgiven your sin, He has dealt with the guilt, the shame, the stain of sin. The Bible talks about it like you've been washed as white as snow, though your sin was scarlet. Man, it's the most wonderful, wonderful promise. There's no groveling before God and there's no groveling before people. You're forgiven. It also means we don't have to minimize or mitigate the significance of sin. We don't have to try to say, well, I'm not, I'm not really that bad a person or my sin wasn't really that bad or my rebellion wasn't really that bad because, see, God, God loves me. Uh, that's actually, that's leaning back into the old way of thinking of trying to earn our salvation or trying to earn God's forgiveness. Can't we done? not For Christians, we're the ones who can even gladly, in a sense, or at least openly say, no, let's bring it all out into the light. Here it all is. I confess my sin in the light of day as accurately as possible, although it exposes my sinfulness. The Lord exposes my weakness, exposes that I'm not who I want to be, exposes that I'm not who I want people to think about me, or I'm not who, how I want people to think about me. That doesn't matter because what we're bringing into light has already been dealt with. It's already been covered. It doesn't stick to us at all. All debts have been paid. It also means because you are forgiven there's nothing that you cannot forgive. Like we always say when we talk about forgiveness, forgiving someone doesn't mean trust is restored or even that relationship is restored. 
When God forgives us, he gives us a new nature and a new heart, gives us the Holy Spirit. Uh, We can't do that for somebody else. And so although our forgiveness means our relationship with him is restored, your forgiveness to someone else doesn't necessarily mean that that relationship will be restored. But it doesn't mean you can forgive them. Thirdly, uh, it means we can rejoice in God's mercy rather than grovel and fear his wrath. This is what Lamentations 3 records. Because of Yahweh's faithful love, we don't perish. For his mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Again, the scripture writers keep coming, keep reminding us of his faithfulness. Not God has forgiven you and now, now he's wiped the slate clean, so now go and live a good life. That's not the transaction. That's not what's happened. But because of his faithfulness, he has forgiven you completely. He has dealt with your sin and rebellion on the cross of Christ. He has removed your sin Stain, guilt, and shame as far as the east is from the west. And now according to his faithfulness, he continues to view you as someone who has not gone from indebted to neutral, but someone who's gone from death to life, from rebellious to perfect, from evil to holy. that Jesus imputes his righteousness to us. And so now when God looks at you, he doesn't view you or or consider you according to your sin or rebellion, but only according to his faithfulness and your forgiveness. So he sees you as perfect. This is what scripture tells us. The father looks at you and sees perfect, spotless, blameless, righteous, daughter, son, And our sonship or our daughtership doesn't waver, doesn't oscillate, doesn't rise or fall depending on how we're doing day by day. But it is according to his faithfulness. It's the most wonderful thing. So his mercies are new every morning. Fresh outpouring of his grace upon us, which is just another expression of his overarching faithfulness towards us. And we, we, we can rejoice in this. We, sh- we should actually rejoice in this. I'm not trying to tell you, you should be joyful, but now we have great reason to be joyful. Lastly, we can walk in freedom. So Galatians 5, for freedom, Christ set us free. Stand firm then and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. So the assurance of forgiveness <clears throat> for us is, it's a, it's a, Cool. It's something we can activate in our lives. We walk in the assurance of our forgiveness. Not in some, it's, it's something that prevents us from becoming arrogant. When we're walking in the assurance of our forgiveness, it means we are reminded that we don't deserve it. We're not walking in our own righteousness. We haven't climbed the ladder. We haven't pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps or you know, in our own strength overcome. But it's a reminder of we don't deserve this, which just highlights how much you are loved by God that he didn't let you stay there. So we don't have to minimize our sinfulness. We can view it accurately because that helps us to understand how much God loves us. Helps us understand how much he's covered. Helps us understand what it cost the beautiful Holy One of Heaven to save us. But it also means we can walk confidently Chin up, head held high, not because we're awesome, but because he's awesome and has acted awesomely towards us. We refuse to put on the yoke of slavery again. Refuse to go, going back to relating to God according to how we feel or according to my works righteousness, but only according to the perfection and the sacrifice of Jesus. We don't grovel and we don't, we don't, we're not arrogantly proud. We live as children of God, walking in the light. So as we live 
in the assurance of forgiveness, we, we want to embrace it wholeheartedly. We want it to be a feature of our life, like a banner that we wave over us. We're forgiven. It means we don't look down on anybody as if we're up on some pedestal of moral superiority, although we've, we've achieved something or we've attained something because we've earned it, but rather we've been gifted this precious, wonderful gift of forgiveness. And we know because even I can be saved, it gives us confidence in communicating the love and the mercy of God to others. Because we know nobody is beyond his forgiveness. God's, God's still in the business of saving. So we don't have to hide, don't have to try to look better than we are, don't have to sweep things under the rug, don't have to keep things hidden or in the dark. We can bring everything into the light, aids our witness, aids our, our understanding of, of who we are, aids our relationship with God because we go to him based on Christ's righteousness and based on his love for us, not arrogantly, but full of thankfulness. So today, if you are, if you're already in Christ, let's walk with the assurance of our forgiveness. If you're visiting today or, or you're not in Christ, you're not a Christian, I want to let you know God loves you. I fully believe that's why you're here today. That in his providence, he has brought you here uh, to hear those young lads share about the goodness of God, to hear me open up scripture, uh, talking about how much God loves you. That there, there is nothing uh, in between God and you that can't be overcome by work he's already done. When Jesus talks about it and the scripture writers and the apostles talk about how do we take hold of this gift? What is it? How, how, does that, how do we go from death to life? They talk about repenting and believing. Repenting, we talk about this a lot. If you see a light person, you've heard me say this hundreds of times. Repenting is, at the same time, it's a turning around from the life you were living before. It's an abandoning, trying to climb up that ladder. And rather, to, to turn around and walk with the Lord. It's also a to thinking how God thinks. So it's bringing into line your thinking with God's thinking. And the believing is acknowledging and accepting that what Jesus has already accomplished is all that is necessary. There's nothing left to do. It's putting our faith, putting our hope, putting our trust, pledging our allegiance to our, our King Jesus who saved us because he loves us. And if we confess our sin, he is faithful and righteous. So if we confess our sin, if we say, yeah, I, I can't do it, my way is not the way. If we repent and come into line with God's way of thinking, and acknowledge what Jesus has done is all that is necessary, put our hope and our trust in him. He is faithful, righteous to forgive us our sins and he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And that is not a wiping the slate clean. That's a imputing to you Jesus' perfection, his holiness, his righteousness. So when, when, again, when the Father looks at you, he sees the perfection of his son Jesus. He sees a beloved son or daughter, not someone who has to now try to, who, or even who is able to now reach up to him, but someone who is, in fact, united with him in Jesus. So there's no going away getting your life in order, no money you have to pay, no pilgrimage you have to go on. Uh, it is like David says, do it immediately, like do it today. Receive this gift of grace. Uh, just ask the person who brought you along, come speak with me or one of our leaders. He would love to pray with you, help you understand how to walk in the liberty of knowing Jesus. Uh, for everyone else, we're going to come gather around the table. We're going to take these elements, the bread for his body, the cup for his blood, again to remind ourselves of the justice, the holiness, and the mercy and the love of God. That his forgiveness is not contingent on my good works or my life, but on what Jesus has already done. 
And so let's, if you're visiting with us, you're in Christ, you're welcome to come and gather around the table as well. Let's come and receive these elements. Remember him. And man, let's, uh, let it help us walk in the assurance of our forgiveness in our words, in the way we relate to God and relate to others, in how we act and the confidence we have uh, that God loves us. Let's do it.